Now welcome to the midweek meeting of the Scalpy Free Church of Scotland continuing. We pray that the Lord will be pleased to bless us as we worship him. Now let us commence the public worship of Almighty God by singing on to his praise from Psalm number 57. Psalm number 57, and from the beginning of the psalm, and it is to the tune uh, Torward. Psalm number 57, from the beginning to the tune Torward. Be merciful to me, O God, thy mercy unto me do thou extend because my soul that put her trust in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings, my refuge I will place until these sad calamities do wholly overpass. And so on to the end of the verse marked three. Psalm number 57, verses one to three, to the tune Thorwood, be merciful to me, O God. Now let us pray. Our eternal and most gracious God, we bow before Thee, acknowledging that Thou art indeed one God and three persons. And as we draw into Thy presence, we are mindful that we can only draw before Thee, before that throne of grace and before that uh, throne with which we have to do, in and through the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank Thee and praise Thee afresh that He is the one who is the high priest of the profession of His people. We praise Thee that He is the one who takes the prayers of Thy people and uh, offers them up as an incense even unto the Most High. And so, Eternal One, as we draw before Thee now afresh at uh, this uh, mid-week, midweek meeting of our congregation, we are conscious that uh, it is indeed a time when we can come and lay aside all that has gone before us in this week and all that lies ahead. We thank Thee for this oasis in the desert of our time and the desert of our experience the desert of our toil here before. And we are mindful, uh, ever gracious one, that in thy providence that uh, thou didst indeed send us toil, toil because of sin. And yet we are mindful that uh, thy word reminds us afresh 
uh, that uh, if a man uh, is going to eat, then he must work. And so, as we draw before thee, we draw before thee with that confession upon our lips that we have sinned against thee in thought and in word and in deed. Even now, as uh, the prayers of thy people are being lifted up, uh, even unto the throne of heaven itself, uh, by thy servant here below, there is sin that is associated with this prayer. Oh, there is sin even as we listen at this very moment in time. And so, eternal Lord, we pray that as it was with the a servant of old, that thou would take the coal from off the altar, and thou would touch on holy lips, we pray, that that uh, touch might be of the touch of sanctification and the touch of holiness. As we uh, draw before thee this evening, we are conscious of our weakness and our frailty. We are conscious, eternal one, that we are indeed uh, heading toward uh, that uh, house appointed for all living. We are conscious that we are heading for eternity itself. And we pray that thou would forbid it, that we would put that thought to the back of our mind, even as thy people, and we would dismiss it as uh, somehow being morbid or somehow not uh, being part of the uh, encouraging experience of thy people. And yet, O oh Lord, we know that it is to be. If uh, we are thine and if we are exercised and if we are growing in grace, it is the most encouraging thing of all to think about eternity, for that is where our Savior is. That is where our beloved Lord reigns. That is where he now is preparing a place for us. The one who is the bridegroom is preparing a home for the bride. So, Lord, we pray that thou would indeed remove our attachments from here below. We pray that we might be those that would uh, not only look at the bricks and look at the mortar, uh, but that rather we would fix our gaze upon uh, the nature of our experience here, and we, we, we would be those who are sojourners, and that uh, the ten pegs of uh, that which would keep us would be removed, and we would be those who, who are on that pilgrimage, uh, walking with thyself towards that celestial city. O oh, gracious Lord, we pray that Thou would be with us now. We thank Thee for all Thy dealings toward us in providence. Uh, we know that it is indeed uh, these dealings with us in providence that are for our holiness and our sanctification. We praise Thee afresh uh, for the prospect of the opening up our uh, worship uh, place here once again. We pray that Thou would be preparing our hearts, that we would wait upon Thee, uh, that we would see no obstacles, but rather we would see uh, that uh, even the very mountains have come down before thee, O Zerubbabel. O oh Lord, we pray that uh, thou would continue to be the one who would look over us and be the one who would be the preparer of our ways. And all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now, would you turn with me, please, in the New Testament to the uh, second epistle of Peter, uh, Second Peter, and Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. We commence our reading at the opening verse. Now, let us hear the word of the Lord. Simon Peter, a servant an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, 
And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance there shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ had showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly the vice fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy uh, of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And thus far we read in the Word of God, and we pray that God will be pleased to bless unto us this reading of his own holy and infallible Word for his name's sake. Now we continue to uh, praise God in the singing of uh, Psalm number 40 in Gaelic. Psalm number 40, and it is to the tune Belerma. Psalm number 40 in Gaelic, from the beginning, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. I waited for the Lord, my God, and patiently did bear. At length to me he did incline my voice and cry to hear. He took me from a fearful pit and from the miry clay, and on a rock he set my feet, establishing my way, and so on. Uh, Psalm number 40, verses 1 to 3 in Gaelic, uh, to God's praise, to the tune, Belerma. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, would you turn with me, please, to that uh, portion of God's Word that we read, the second epistle of Peter, and 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And we might read again the words that we have in verses 10 and 11. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and so on. Now, when you come here to these words that we find in Second Peter, these words here have been taken a number of ways. They have been taken in the sense of, I suppose, an evangelistic thrust, in that there is this uh, sense that goes to man that he is to make his calling and election sure. In other words, he's to close with Christ. And of course, that is most certainly part of the meaning here. Uh, but there is another dimension which uh, is, I believe, the main focus of what we have here. It is that we are to come and we are so to make our calling and election sure. We are to be so convinced that we have our calling, and we have an election in Christ Jesus. In other words, that we are to ensure that we are assured of faith in Christ. You see, when Peter comes in both his first epistle and in his second epistle, he, he's helping these early Christians, those who are at this point in time suffering for Christ, those who, who are being uh, put out into the public arenas, uh, jeered on while the animals indeed took their lives, when they were themselves a spectacle and they were suffering death because, for the very reason that they were Christians. And Peter comes, and in the first epistle, he's reminding those Christians, as he reminds us, uh, he reminds us that uh, we are those who have the great privileges. First uh, Peter chapter 1, he says, You're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now, this must have been an encouraging word. This must have been an uplifting word to those who were uh, suffering great, adversary, uh, great adversaries. And they would have been encouraged when Peter reminded them of the ultimate importance of their standing in Christ. Well, so he's helping these early Christians. And he's reminding them here in second. Uh, epistle of Peter. Uh, he's reminding them in verses 1 to, to 4 of very much the same substance. He's reminding uh, the Christians of what God has done for them. Uh, we, we see that according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You see, beloved, this evening, you have been given all things that pertain unto the Christian life and godliness. It is not that we are left to our own devices. It is not that we are uh, redeemed, that we uh, have been taken out of the, the dunghill of this world, and that we have been left to our own devices. No, he says, you have been given all things that pertain unto life. We are not left as those who struggle. We have the Scriptures. We, there in the mirror of God's Word, we see, as it were, clearly who God is. We see, 
as it were, Christ as he is brought before us in the Scriptures. Oh, we see him. We see him as he works in our lives. So he's reminding these Christians, you have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And friends, a Christian who says, oh, I, I lack this, or I, uh, I don't have that in order to be this kind of Christian, or to be uh, reaching that standard that the Bible has laid, that's wrong, friends. It's wrong because it goes against Scripture. Through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. We have been called, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, friends, what has he given us? He has given us these precious promises, these great and precious promises. And what are the purpose of the promises? Well, the purpose of the promises is that we might be those who have that knowledge that we are partakers of the divine nature. You know, often we have a struggle with assurance. But we then have to ask the, uh, ourselves the question, why is it we struggle with assurance? Why is it that so often we, uh, we, we lack that certainty uh, if there are those and they lack that certainty? Why is it so often that they lack that certainty? It is, friends, they have not gone to the promises. Or if they have gone to the Scriptures, they believe that those promises are for someone else. Maybe they, they come here and they believe that these great and precious promises are for the people in Peter's day. No, friends, if you're in Christ, these great and precious promises have been given to you for a purpose. And it is sinful not to take them for that purpose. It is sinful then, if you are in Christ, to continue to doubt that you're in Christ uh, by laying aside these great and precious promises. And he reminds us that we are those who, having escaped the corruption that is in this world, true lust. So he's reminding God's people that he has given them all things that pertain unto godliness and life. He has taken them, not out of the world, but he has taken them out of the dominion of sin in their lives in the world. And he's doing this for a purpose, that they might be assured that they are in Christ. And friends, that's what I want us to concentrate on this evening, the duty of the assurance of salvation. We have a duty to be assured that we are Christians. We cannot go on through life, and I, I, I speak to those uh, who may be the Lord's people, and you, you have this truth laid upon your heart that you are the Lord's people, and yet you, you, you look uh, at the various doubts that you have, and you allow those doubts uh, to be those that overshadow any of the other assurances that you have. So, in other words, what you do is you major on the minor little doubts, and you do not major on the major assurance that you have. And you allow those little doubts to keep you from professing the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, friends, let me say this. You know, and I'm sure you have over these, these past um, 16 or 17 months that we have been here, or however long, uh, that I'm, I'm not one that um, would certainly ever push someone or coerce someone to making a profession of faith. That is, that is a totally wrong thing to do. Um, um, and easy believism often does that. 
And so often ministers push people, uh, and the result is a total pastoral uh, calamity. And it would be uh, a sin for those who are not in Christ to make a profession of faith that they are in Christ and, and go to the table of the Lord. It is equally a sin for those who are the Lord's people not to profess his name. The Song of Solomon reminds us that we are to crown him in the days of his espousals. We are to throw our crowns at his feet and by crowning Christ so that uh, his, his name is indeed uplifted and he receives the honor due unto his name. There are two points that come out here, therefore, uh, in, in this passage before us. The first thing is this, that you are to be certain about your salvation. Verse 10, you are to be certain about your salvation. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Now, you'll notice here what Peter is doing. Peter is bringing before uh, these New Testament uh, Christians, those who are suffering persecution, those who might have been asking the question, well, why is it if I am one of the Lord's people, I'm going through this great trial, my faith has been tested, surely he wouldn't test me if I was one of the Lord's. Well, you, you'll notice here what, what the apostle is, is doing. He's saying that we are to have an eagerness. We are to have an eagerness. He says, Wherefore the rather brethren? You see, that word wherefore, it, it summarizes up everything that has gone before in the previous verses. You'll notice what we have in, in verse 8. This assurance that is brought in verse 8. For if these things be in you, in other words, uh, godliness, brotherly kindness, um, charity or love, and all that he has said in the previous uh, verses, he said, if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what was he speaking about there? When he says, make you fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, was he speaking about here the importance of an academic knowledge of Christ? To, to know uh, in, in, a, in an outward way, a formal way, in a an encyclopedic way, uh, all of the facts about the, the life of Christ, uh, about the miracles of Christ, about the, the work of Christ. No, he wasn't speaking about that. He was speaking about that in relation to assurance that we might have this knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, which shall be fruitful in our lives which shall be fruitful in our lives. So when he comes here and he's speaking about this knowledge, he's, he's including himself in this. You see, Peter is coming here and he's saying, well, it is also necessary for, for me to know these things. He's speaking from experience. And then he comes in verse 9. And while he's speaking in verse 8 about the assurance about this, this knowledge that we would have that we are in Christ, when we see in our lives all of those marks of grace. Our friends, you know, how easy it is for us to see the marks of grace in other people. But we don't see the marks of grace in ourselves. And we don't do that because we look into even the very heart itself and we see the sin there. And sometimes we, we see the great iniquity there. And sometimes we see the coldness there. And sometimes we see the distance and the formality of our religion there. And you see, 
The very fact is, when we see all of those things, when those things cast us down and when our hearts are heavy because of those things, that in itself is a mark of grace. You see, if we had no you life, we would not see the coldness of our religion. Indeed, we would be delighted with how well we were doing. We would take pride in the fact that we come to God's house. We would take pride in the fact that we have, we have always come to God's house and our parents before us came. We would be taking pride in all of these things. But when our hearts are heavy because of our coldness, that is because there is a warmth in the Spirit. There is a warmth in the Spirit. So when he comes here in verse 8, and he's speaking about this, this assurance and this knowledge that is needed uh, in order that we might be fruitful Christians, because a, a person who is not assured uh, and who is who's not uh, owning the Lord is somebody who's not fruitful. They cannot be fruitful. Um, they, they, are, they are those who, who can't be fruitful in many areas, even to do with the kingdom. They can't be fruitful in, in the prayer meeting. Perhaps if they're men, they can't be fruitful in the prayer meeting because they can't be called on to pray. Uh, perhaps they can't uh, be fruitful in, in office in the church or, or whatever it, it is. But friends, the most important thing is they're not fruitful in their own lives because they lack this assurance. And somebody who lacks an assurance, and it is a great lack to them, they're struggling. They, they're, sometimes they're on a high and sometimes they're on a spiritual low. Well, then he comes here in verse 9, and he says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now, you see the meaning of what I was saying earlier on. This here, this verse 10, must speak about those who have an assurance of faith rather than those uh, who are still outside of Christ. Because he's speaking here about those in verse 9. And he's saying, and hath forgotten he was purged from his old sins. Well, if they were still outside of Christ, they had not been purged from their old sins. So he's speaking here about a Christian. And he's saying it is important that they have this knowledge. Now, in verse 8, he was including himself, uh, that it was important that he had this knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he's not including himself. You'll notice when he says, but he that lack it. He didn't say, we who lack. He says, he that lack it. So in verse 8, for assurance, he's speaking about himself as well. And in verse 9, he is saying it is detrimental if we lack these things. We do not have an assurance that our sins have been purged. And then, friends, he comes and he, he speaks about those who are brethren. Those who are brethren, verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, that word brethren, it, it only occurs here uh, in, in Peter. Peter often speaks about the phrase, dear friends. Uh, he speaks about that in First Peter. He speaks about that in, in Second Peter. And when he comes here in verse 10, and he, he uses the word rather brethren, he's showing that he is concerned for their spiritual well-being. And friends, ministers in the congregations, uh, elders and office bearers, we are concerned for spiritual well-being. And that is why this is such an important area that we would know our calling and our election. And he, he's reminding uh, the folks here, he's saying, well, is it an important issue? Yes, it is. He says, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, that's the same exhortation that he gives in verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence 
add to your faith virtue. So it has the same importance as growing in grace. Growing in grace receives the same command, it receives the same injunction, it receives the same impression as we have here in verse 10 to make our calling and election sure. Give all diligence. Put every effort into it. Do not be content that you have a lack of assurance, friends. Do not be content with it. You are to act without delay. He's saying give diligence. Partly uh, of a daily routine, uh, you are to come to the Lord. You are to look to the promises. You are to seek the promises. You are to see those promises as promises for the sustaining of your faith and assurance. Let me say this in passing. We might have set up in our minds various things that we believe ourselves, maybe because we have heard others speaking about it, that are necessary for us to be assured. What do I mean by that? Well, some people might have in their minds that their conversion should be like, as we have said before, Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus, or the Philippian jailer's conversion, or maybe that they, they should have a, a, a text to, to show uh, and to lean upon. Well, friends, if we have those props, they are, they are like, we're, we're using those like walking sticks. We are using those like props. Now, what happens when you take away the prop? If you're leaning on the prop, what happens when you take it away? You fall. You fall. Rather, if we come and we use the Word of God, God's ordained way, the promises, the Word of God, to be our assurance, then when we have trials, when we have difficulties, when we are cast down, that is a prop that can never be taken away. Indeed, our faith, faith is the walking without the prop. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Thomas? When Thomas said, well, like, except I see him, except I put my hands into a sign, I will not believe. In other words, except I have the prop of my eyesight and my touch and my feeling, I will not believe. Jesus rebukes Thomas. And he said, blessed is he that had not seen and yet believed. That is faith. That is faith. So we are to come with eagerness, but we are to, to look for uh, election itself. Make your calling and election sure. See, when Peter speaks here about calling and election, it's, it's really the same uh, thing he's speaking about. It's the same article that's, that's used here in, in Greek. In other words, it is a assurance, as we have said itself. This uh, approach into the mind that we are Christ and Christ is ours. You see, it, it's, it's a two-way. Uh, we, we, could, we could believe that, that Christ is, is the Savior of others. That's, that's a, a, an academic faith. That's a, a, that's a, a faith of ascent. We could believe that, that Christ is the Savior of sinners. Uh, and, I, and I hope that each and every one does. Um, you have been coming here uh, over the years. You will have heard that. And so you would believe that. But it is another thing to, to believe that Christ is your Savior. And it's when you are convinced of that, that you then have assurance. Now, of course, in, in the ordinary logic of things, election comes before calling. Uh, but Peter here is saying, from man's view, from our view, it's calling comes before election. Now, what is that calling? 
Well, that calling is when the preaching of the word goes forth. Ordinarily, when the preaching of the gospel goes forth. That God blesses that word that goes forth in a congregation like this. That God blesses that word particularly to the heart. And so the heart is moved. And so the, the affections are moved. So the faculties of the soul are moved, the, the mind and the will. And they are so moved that there is a laying hold on Christ. We speak about that as the, the external call goes forth in, in the preaching of the gospel. We speak about that as the internal call. It is God himself, by his Spirit, that's calling. And then when that happens, we even perhaps later come to that, that assurance. Well, I must be one of the Lord's. I'm one of the Lord's. Therefore, my, la my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, the Lord has, has chosen me. Why did he choose me? Well, friends, as we have said before, because he did so. So we come to that conclusion after we receive that call from God of election. But really, election comes first because God had so ordained it. So from God's point of view, election comes first before our calling, but from ourselves, from our point of view, calling comes before election. But you are called, you are called, but you must exert yourself. Uh, Paul writing to the Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 12 and following, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So there is a working in, in order that there might be a working out. So that God works in us, in order that we might then work out in faith and assurance. And election is God's redemptive act. It's, you know, people often ask, well, am I elect? Or am I in the election? Friends, that is not your business to ask that question. It is not my business to find out the answer of that question, not even for my own soul. That is God's realm. That is God's realm. What you have to do and what I have to do is to make our calling and our election sure. And this calling is it's, it's not merely a, a, an invitation. Even the preaching of the gospel, when it goes forth uh, in that external call, it's not really an invitation. God is there in power in the word as it goes forth, and it is a command. Oh, that is the thing that men and women in Scotland today need to realize, that when the word of God goes forth, it is a command that they come, because he is the one who has given the word. He's the great king of all of the earth. It is, uh, as one of our uh, our old ministers, Kennedy of Dingwall, used to say, it is an imperious command. In other words, it comes with all the power of an imperial authority. So be certain of your salvation with, with eagerness. Look at the election. But then see that it is established. And this is to be the purpose of all our, our exertion, is that we are to be able to stand. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Ye shall never fall. It is to stand. To stand. One of our uh, old Scottish divines, Alexander Nisbet, uh, said this. He said, the more uh, that a Christian attains to 
the more he shall see in clearness and certainty that he was from eternity chosen in Christ and is in time effectually called. You see, friends, how are you going to stand? How are you not going to be buffeted uh, under circumstances and under trials uh, when you have those great problems in, in family? Uh, when, when your faith in a personal level is, is, is being attacked. Well, friends, you look for the marks and you see what Christ has done for your soul. And so you lay hold uh, as one drowning onto, onto the, the life boys that have been given out. And as you lay hold upon those, then, friends, you're not going to sink. You're not going to sink. Because, as we have said so often, it does not depend upon our strength uh, and our grip upon the Savior, but upon his hold upon us. And no man shall pluck his people out of his hand. So we have in the first place this um, injunction, be certain about your salvation. But you have in the second place, and we just have two points this evening, we have in the second place, be received for your salvation. Verse 11, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The literal translation at the start of this verse is, for in this way, for in this way uh, shall be ministered unto you abundance into the everlasting kingdom and so on. In other words, this is where we personally affirm our calling. And it is when we personally affirm our calling that the believer enters into the kingdom. And we'll deal with this rather quickly. It comes in under three headings. First of all, the rewards. The rewards. God responds uh, here to man's faithfulness. You know, the faithfulness is give all diligence uh, to make your calling and election sure. And it is when we do that that God responds to that and he, he richly provides an entry into the kingdom. For so an entrance shall be uh, ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. Abundantly. See, how, what is the richness of entering into this kingdom. Well, it doesn't describe the manner of entering into the kingdom. That's not what the word abundantly here or, or richness describes, but rather the event itself of entering into the kingdom. So not the manner, not how we do it, but the event itself. Now this is important. This is important here for the New Testament believers. Some of them would enter into that kingdom with their limbs pulled apart by lions in an arena. He said it doesn't matter about the event. You know, friends, I, I, I fear today that many, many Christians and, and they, they, they seem to see and, and, you know, it is natural in a way that we, we might think about uh, our, our death and how we, we leave the scene of time. And um, w w there are many things that we would not wish for. And, and many today seem to be uh, so concerned about the virus that if they were to be taken out with this, this virus, that somehow that would not be uh, an abundance it would not be uh, the Lord ministering on to us abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. He says, it doesn't matter how you leave. It doesn't matter how you enter into the kingdom. For there's one thing for sure. We might leave here. We might leave here with the coronavirus. We'll not enter into the kingdom with the coronavirus. For nothing that the violet shall enter therein. There is no more sickness. 
There's no more curse. There's no more crying. So he's not talking here about how we leave, but he's talking about the event itself. And he says, I'm rich, richly uh, blessing you into that everlasting kingdom. You know, how shall we compare? As the apostle says elsewhere, how shall we compare that great treasure that he has laid up for us with anything that happens here below? You see, so often in our frailty, what we do not do is we do not see in the fullness the glory of what Christ has given us. And if we could even in a part with our eyes see the, the fullness of the majesty of the blessing of what he has given us, then we would see the problems and the issues here below as a lot less. We would see them as a lot less, not insignificant. We're not saying that. But we would put them in their right place and in their right order. So he says that there are rewards and he says the, the event of entering in to that kingdom is important. Now, this kingdom here is, is, is a twofold kingdom, of course. It is uh, the kingdom that when we come to the Lord that we are already part of, which is the kingdom of all of God's people, both here and in glory. Because remember what uh, we read in, a, in Ephesians. We have the earnest of the Spirit. In other words, we have part of the payment already here. And it is of the same substance of that which is yet to be. Uh, we have the deed here, and it's as good as if we were there. So we are to see uh, that uh, there is indeed a, a great and glorious reward laid out for us. And, and friends, there's a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, the, and the children coming to him. I think it's a beautiful picture. And you will remember that as they were coming to him, the disciples were overprotective. They were overprotective of the Lord, and they were putting away the children, and they were upbraiding the parents. And oh, how parents should not be felt uh, embarrassed, or, or how they should not be punished for being parents. We welcome parents here. We welcome children here. We would love to see an awful lot more children here and see them uh, often here and see them with their parents and their grandparents. What a wonderful blessing that is. But they were, they were removing the children from the presence of Christ. And Christ, you will remember, says, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. That is their faith is the faith of those who enter in. Not a, not a childish faith, but a childlike faith. It is a faith of trust. And friends, when we enter this kingdom, we have a faith of trust, depending all upon the Lord. Have you gone through shipwreck? Have you gone through fire? Have you gone through great trouble, illness? The illness of a loved one is even perhaps uh, worse to us than uh, an illness we might have ourselves. Well, friends, we might go through these things here. And those might be the very things that uh, would, would even take us into this, this kingdom that is yet to be. But it's going to be one of triumph. One of triumph. So there are rewards, and those rewards are those that we are to see that we will be received for our salvation. But there is the place. You notice what he says there in verse, uh, verse 11. He says, uh, into the everlasting kingdom, or into the eternal kingdom, and that is a, a word that's only uh, used here to, to describe the kingdom. You see, friends, this kingdom is an imperishable kingdom. And, and Peter, Peter brings that uh, in the first epistle as well, uh, when, when he, he, he speaks about this. Um, and he, he says, 
to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and the faded not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed the last time. That is an eternal kingdom. Not like the inheritance here below, not like Canaan, not like all of the trouble of there, but this is an eternal kingdom. And it is a kingdom where Christ is king. And as Jesus teaches um, in, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, he says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This is, this is where our king reigns. You know, governments here on the earth, they believe they reign. And not only do they believe that they reign, they believe they reign supremely. And not only do they believe that they reign supremely, but they believe at the back of their minds that they reign, they reign supremely, and they almost reign everlastingly. No, friends, that is not so. There is a place where there is a king and a kingdom that is everlasting and eternal. And Christ is the one that has all the power in heaven, but also on the earth. Also on the earth. Miss Sturgeon, Christ is ruling you. Mr. Johnston, Christ is ruling you. There are rewards. Be received for your salvation because of the rewards. See the place. Oh, the place is this everlasting kingdom. Uh, but see the significance. See the significance. You know, there is an entry to this kingdom. And it is an entry uh, to grace itself. But you see... This reference here is, as we have been saying, it's not just a reference to the heavenly kingdom, but it is also to the kingdom here below, the kingdom of the invisible church. The invisible church is the church that's made up of uh, the saints alive and the saints glorified. The church militant, the church triumphant. And what does Peter say about this? Well, Peter says something very interesting in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. It's a beautiful reference, a beautiful picture of what is yet to be. He says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, Wherein dwelleth righteousness. New heavens and a new earth. Now, friends, where is this new heaven? Where is this new earth? Where is this new earth when the body and the soul is going to be reunited? At that great day. Well, friends, I do not believe for one moment. I do not believe that that new earth is going to be a rejuvenated earth here. Now, why do I not believe that? Well, I do not believe that because where is Christ? Is Christ going to be on this renewed earth? Or is Christ going to be in heaven? Well, if Christ is going to be in heaven, then Christ is not going to, at some time, allow his people or to cause his people to be extradited out of heaven, to be sent out of heaven, to be banished out of heaven, to be and something here where he is not. No, rather this reference to a new heavens and a new earth is 
a new heaven. Well, that is, that is where God is. And a new earth. It is new to us because we have come from here and we have gone there. Now, when we think about the earth, what do we think about? Well, we think about the earth. That is where we live. That is our dwelling place. So this new place is going to be this new heaven and new earth. This is going to be the new living place of his people. It's not going to be on the earth. It's going to be in heaven. And it's going to be with Christ forevermore. That is your reward. That is your reward. That is your salvation. That is your hope. And friends, if there is anything that robs you from that hope, as those who are trusting in the Lord by faith and by trust, if there is anything that robs you from that, you are to give all diligence to make your calling and election sure. In other words, you are to give all diligence to be assured of that hope in Christ. And you are to have the enjoyment of the union that you have with the Lord. That's what assurance is. It is the enjoyment. It is the knowledge of knowing that we have been united with Christ. We speak about communion and union. Union and communion. Well, there is the communion, the enjoyment, the fellowship that we have with the Lord when we are assured. So, friends, what are we to do? Well, we are to uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an inheritance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now may the Lord bless these words to us for his name's sake. Let us pray. Our gracious and Ever-blessed Lord, we thank Thee for the sure promises that Thou hast given us in Thy Word. Ah, we pray that we would not crave for something more or covet something greater than the providence and the provisions that Thou in Thine own eternal counsel hast so ordained to give. So we pray that Thou would bless this Word this evening, that Thou would go before it, that Thou would be the breaker-up of our way, And all we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Now we close by singing to God's praise from Psalm number 122. Psalm number 122, and it is to the Tune Free Church. Psalm 122, a song of degrees of David. I joined when to the house of God go up, they said to me. Jerusalem, within thy gates, our feet shall standing be. Jerusalem, as a city is, compactly built together. And to that place the tribes go up, the tribes of God go thither. And so on to the end of the psalm. Psalm number 122, to the tune free church. I joined when to the house of God go up, they said to me. I joy Yeah.
Now, the following are the intimations, God willing. Uh, the broadcasts go out at 12 noon and 6 p.m. Uh, on the uh, Sabbath to come. Uh, the Kirk session uh, met last night and uh, resolved the, to proceed with the opening of the church. Um, the first Sabbath meetings in the church, God willing, on uh, Sabbath, the 2nd of August at the usual times. Uh, and of all possible to have the prayer meeting commencing here on the 29th of July. Um, the deacon's court will meet here, God willing, uh, tomorrow evening at half past seven. Now, let, uh, oh, sorry, on Friday evening at half past seven. Now, let me say that um, there will need to be quite considerable changes here. Uh, there will undoubtedly need to be uh, a, a reseating plan in order to accommodate everybody. So uh, do please be prepared that um, you will have a strong likelihood of having to, to move seats. And we're thankful that um, uh, in, in, in the free church, nobody owns a seat. We don't pay rent anymore for that. That, that finished uh, many centuries ago. So um, we know that uh, the Lord's people will be praying and they will be glad for the day that the house of God once again uh, opens. Uh, so there will be various changes, and uh, I will be sending out a, a letter to every home, and you will have full instructions before the time that we uh, meet. But I do ask you to continue to pray, and to pray with thanksgiving, to pray that the Lord would receive the thanks that is glory and glory due unto his name. For he is the one who uh, indeed removes all of the obstacles that are laid before us. And all these intimations are subject to the will of the Lord. Let us close with the Lord's benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.